With us today is Amy Edmondson. She wrote a terrific book called Teaming, How Organizations Learn, Innovate, and Compete in the Knowledge Economy. Uh, Amy is both a fantastic, thoughtful, disciplined researcher and writer. She's the Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at Harvard Business School, where she teaches courses in leadership, organizational learnings, and operations management in the MBA and executive ed programs. And I'm delighted to have Amy with us today. The, the book teaming is filled with really interesting stories and research, which is sort of the, the, the um, perfecta or the double perfecta. I don't know exactly know what the title is. But, yeah. but anyway, Amy, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you for having me. Amy, let's jump in with teaming. What do you mean by teaming? You've made a verb out of a noun. What what well what I mean is that in more and more organizations the nature of the teamwork is not just in intact teams. It's it's across boundaries of all kinds. So if I just take a step back, a great deal of research and very good advice on team effectiveness says first and foremost, get the structures right. Like if you have the right people on the team and it's a kind of clearly composed, bounded group of people with a shared goal and the right resources and, and you know, the right coaching and so on, they'll, they'll tend to perform better than if they don't have the right structures. Absolutely agree with that perspective. And more and more, the teams I see in healthcare organizations, in high tech, in so many fast-paced global organizations today are not able to be really stable and bounded. In other words, they don't have the luxury of getting the structures right before they must perform. It's Sometimes, interesting because even the idea of an intact team is betrayed by the matrixed, networky kind of environment that we're all operating in. Exactly. In fact, life in the matrix. You know, it's a whole right. different. It's a whole different game. It's like, yes, I've got my team or the people I work most closely with, and more often than not, I have to be teaming with people in other regions, other functions, other, you know, uh, other disciplines. And it's, it's challenging, right? So that's this dynamic perspective. So how much is teaming really about individual skill versus sort of orchestrated dynamic? Oh, I, I like to say it, there is skill and it is an, in, there is individual skill here that needs to be, I think, developed and, and, and nourished. Uh, but it's, it's part mindset and part skill and part just context. I always want to be clear. I'm not saying here's this brand new thing I've thought of. It's teaming. Go do it. It's going to be good for you. I'm saying like it or not, you're doing it. Um, and can we help you do it better? Yeah, you're doing it, and, and maybe poorly, maybe well, maybe periodically, maybe um, uncontrollably. And, right. And maybe there could be a discipline around it. Exactly, exactly. So the, you know, the mindset is one of kind of curiosity and situational humility. Like, I, I know I have a valid point of view. I know, you know, I have expertise. I know a lot, and... I'm missing something. So I so, love that. And, and I, I, I talk a lot about sort of the combination of confidence and humility. Yeah. And I find it's very tricky because people who are too confident are actually insecure, not actually confident. They come off as arrogant. And people who have too much humility often don't stand for themselves. And, and I'm curious about the gender element of that because I, I, yeah. you know, I, I was just reading some research that, uh, that if – a man is um, is going up for a job and has four of the ten needed characteristics. He'll raise mm -hmm. his hand and say, "I can make it." And if yeah. a woman looks at the same job, if she doesn't have ten of the ten characteristics, she'll say, "I'm not ready." And I wonder whether there's like that, you know, what the confidence and humility, or or the, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the words that you used, but they were more elegant than that. Uh, mm -hmm. But this challenge of really being in a team and, and being able to put yourself out there and at the same time being really open and curious to, to other people's perspectives. And so, so I read that study too and I think it's such an interesting point and it rings true. 
Um, and, you know, I sometimes wish I could reinvent myself as a gender expert because there's so much interesting work there. And it's it's not it's not mine. But it, as I said, it rings true. Yeah. So so there's you know, there's and, even you know, gender differences tend to be, you know, it, every, we, we all have wherever we are, we're on some curve, some distribution. And the differences between the gender distributions, you know, tend to be real but small. Which means there's plenty of people in both genders. Right. Makes in, a lot of sense. Overly confident or overly right. overly humble. And we all know them. And we all right, we all know them. So I have great I, friends I, I, who are I, living in red states and great right. friends who are living in blue states. Right. And we don't want to say, you know, yeah, if you're a woman, forget it. You're in trouble. Right. You're going to be too, right. you know, it's not true. And if you're a man, you can't get this right. Not true. Right. Uh, so, but, but that's why I like the term situational humility, because I don't have to be, you know, a complete wimp. I don't have to say, oh, I don't know anything and roll over and play dead. What I'm saying is in some situations more than others, it is only wise to say, Wow. Right. Look out, look ahead, recognize we don't know very much about how to get this right. And so I'm all ears, right? I, I, I've got to understand what you think. And, and right. that's situational humility. Right? I love it. And, and it actually um, it, it, it references or speaks to or connects me to Carol Dweck's work, right, on growth versus fixed mindset. Yeah. And, and this idea that if you really have a fixed mindset, which for, for listeners, if I've interviewed Carol and you can listen to that podcast, but, but if you don't know, a fixed mindset means I think my IQ and how intelligent I am and my capability is fixed. And so when I hit up against failure or something I don't know, rather than be curious, I get defensive because it will represent a limitation to me that I don't want to face. If I have a growth mindset, which means that I could grow in my IQ and my intelligence and my capability, then I look at those uh, walls that I hit as opportunities to expand my capacity to act in the world. And, and I wonder whether you found, you know, like that, if you've looked at that at all, and yeah. whether there's like the growth mindset is critical to being able to be situationally, you know, yeah. confident and, and humility. I couldn't agree more. And I, I love Carol Dweck's work. And I love the idea of, 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 of mindset and talking about a mindset. And, and I'm, I'm also always grateful and pleased that she says this can be learned, right? This isn't, right. Yeah. you know, when you first read about it, you think, well, wait a minute, I'm, you know, I'm screwed because I'm a fixed mindset person. No, we can all, we can all learn to be more of a growth mindset person, which means we can learn to recognize that, Ooh, I don't know everything and that's okay. And, 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 and learn to not equate, you know, something bad happening with it being an indication that I'm just not good enough, right? right. I'm not smart right. enough. No. I'm standing in a new position that I've never been in before. Ergo, things will go right, things will go wrong. So humility, curiosity, you know, and I think it's helped by passion, right? If I get really, if I really care about what we're trying to do, you know, if I can help myself care more about what we're trying to do than about how I look, I'm, I'm off and running. Yeah, learning, and you've talked a lot in this conversation about learning, and I was surprised, pleasantly surprised to see how much learning was the core of this book and how critical it is to being, to, to teaming, right? To being effective at teaming. Right. It really is learning. I mean, in fact, that was my, I came into all this work from the perspective of wanting to know, I mean, this is almost sounds naive now, but I wanted to know how do you create learning organizations? Um, and, and then, so I went in and, you know, how do you, how do you, why is it that organizations can get so stuck and, and then be producing the wrong products or, you know, alienating customers in ways because they've gotten stuck in the past? And, and then the more I got in, the more time I spent in organizations, the more I realized that the learning engines were teams and teaming, right? That, that that's where, that's where we innovate. That's where we do continuous improvement. That's where we, you know, um, problem solve. And, and so teaming and, learning are intertwined in very deep ways. So I'm curious, I don't know if your research covered this, but I'm curious about, I don't know why I'm thinking of all these different people yeah. and the, the, the work that they've done, but I'm thinking about Susan Cain right now, who I don't know and haven't met. Um, <laughs> but, but this idea of introversion and, and, yeah. and, and, I, and like for me, I'm a, I agree with you 100% that teams 
and teaming is critical to learning because I, I'm out there and I'm engaging with people and they push back and I and then they push back and I think, huh, you know, I, yeah. I hadn't thought about that perspective. And I wonder whether it's different for people who, you know, who, who don't learn by verbalizing things or don't, you know, or who tend to learn more um, yeah. reading a book and quietly. I'm just curious whether you've seen any yeah. distinction in that. Well, I think we all have to do both. We all have to do some, you know, book learning, right? We have to, we have to read, we have to get ourselves up to speed on the latest information. Um, and we have to work together with other people to solve problems that are, that are new, that are real time, that are kind of experiential. So what, what I, you know, what, what we know about introverts and extroverts is not that introverts are, don't have interpersonal skill or can't be out there teaming and learning real time, but that it takes more energy, right? right? So, you know, they, if, and I'm an introvert, so I get my energy. I recharge my energy by curling up with the book. Um, but it doesn't make me unable to interact. And I actually, I enjoy it, right? I enjoy, I enjoy interacting with you right here. And it feels so real. Um, and extroverts, the difference for extroverts is that this is how they get their energy. This is how they get their ideas. So they might have a slight advantage. Right. However, it doesn't make the world, you know, it doesn't make them more or less psychologically safe. Right. right. It just makes them more energized. So I love what you just said around psychological safety, too, because we know from a lot of research how important that is. And, and you know, what are some of the, the, the ways in which people create that kind of psychological safety that predisposes a learning environment right. to support right. good teaming? But, you know, I think it, I, I'm increasingly thinking this is pretty simple, right? By the way, simple doesn't yeah, mean easy, easy right? right? Yeah. So, so this, it's, First and foremost, I think, and it, this relates to mindset, but it's framing the work, right? We are launching a new product. No one has ever been here before, or we are, you know, solving a tough problem, or we are trying to uh, get our costs down to a level that we've never had before. Whatever the challenge is, it's, it's, it's novel. It's going to take all of us using our heads, you, you know, listening. Like, so, so in a sense, Framing the work is the kind of work for which uncertainty exists. You know, we're going to get it wrong before we get it right. Whatever. It just creates, you know, we're making, making the case, creating the rationale for why psychological safety um, is needed, why your voice is needed. The second, so framing work, the second bit is being proactive in inviting others input, right? I can sit there. I can think, oh, yeah, if Peter has something to say, he'll say it. Or I can say, hey, Peter, what do you think about this? Right. You know, what do you bring? And if I say, Peter, what do you bring? You'll feel awkward not answering. Right. right? I've right. taken away the need for you to kind of be courageous That's by great. giving you the platform. And then right. the third thing is, no matter what you say, whether I like it or not, I'm going to respond appreciatively. That doesn't mean I won't push back. It doesn't mean I won't try to make it better. But I will be, oh, thank you so much for that perspective. Right. Now, Here's some other things I'd like us to consider. I mean, right. let's put them out there, right? But I'm always kind of being grateful that you're here and that you took that risk. You know, it's interesting because saying as the leader or whoever to say, hey, you know, Peter, hey, Amy, what do you think about this? It doesn't necessarily remove courage as a concept from the table, but it no. shifts who has to show it. Meaning the leader at that point has to be the one to say, I'm going to actually show the courage to reach out to you That's and true. say, hey, Amy, what do you think? That's true. And I think that's right because leaders have to go first, right? right. You know, why should I expect you to be courageous? Why should I require you to have the courage when I'm not willing right. to, to do that myself? Right. I love I like it. that. That's a really good point that it's still, there's still courage, but it's, I, I'm, I'm going first. You're I'm putting strong. it in a different, you're putting it where it belongs in many you're cases or where, where it really. should be strongest. Yeah. So, so we talked very briefly before the call about this, uh, before this conversation about, um, this challenge that I've often found, which is, you know, there's a tremendous amount of research that looks at uh, at teams, for example, or let's just take psychological safety because it's a great example and we're talking about it, where, you know, what are the best practices for creating psychological safety? And then you go into a team and you see a leader who is insecure or feels vulnerable, doesn't mm. create psychological uh, safety has the sort of false confidence that that bleeds right. into arrogance, um, lacking humility, 
does it because they, uh, you know, they're for whatever reasons, they're, they're unsure themselves. And, and I'm curious if you've seen stories or, or, you know, have a perspective on not just here are the um, best practices of creating safety, psychological safety in a team, but here's what people, here's what people have done to shift from being that maybe arrogant, maybe unconscious leader who doesn't create, you know, who just bulls through, who has their perspective uh, and, 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 and was able to then create a psychologically safe environment and what had to happen for that transformation to occur. Yeah. I think there's probably as many different ways to help people, you know, as there are people who've made those transitions. Right. But one, one obvious one is, is of course, coaching of some kind and and quite often people what what you know what you have to i think what we have to accept is that most people are not being ineffective on purpose right, right? they're 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 being ineffective right. that's how they learn to be right. or that's how they that was the model they were exposed to or whatever and so um i think our first responsibility whether as researchers or or interventionists in any in any way is to is to help people see impact Right. And then, of course, to be very careful about separating impact from intention or right? just right. because someone has a really negative impact on their team um, doesn't mean, you know, that they're a bad person. That right. they're, you know, they're trying to harm people. In, in fact, I think most people are blind. Right. I mean, we are in a sense, we're born blind um, to the impact we're having on others at any given time. Right. It's something we need to, you know, we need to, all leaders need to remind themselves, I'm blind. Right? And then if I recognize that I'm blind, that's, that's not fun. I, so I'm going to be asking questions. I'm going to be looking to you to, you know, to give me feedback, to help me right, understand right. what you heard or what. So, so I think you're trying to enlighten, and most of us want to be enlightened, although we don't, you know, we might kick and scream along the way, but on, as to impact. And then... So, and then once, once I'm more aware of the impact I'm having and how it's not really what I want, I mean, I want to get these results. I want to, I want this project to be a, a smashing success. Um, then I'm more open to learning and practicing some of the skills that I need to practice. The funny thing is none, none of the skills that I talk about are hard. You know, we just, you know, they're not like going to the Olympics and doing something that's just absolutely superhuman. They're only hard because our brains, you know, are structured in such a way that we forget to do them. For example, well, I, I, let me let me let me, right? let me push back on that for a second because okay. it's yeah. and, and I'm I'm now I'm coming out with a new book in in July called Leading with Emotional Courage, and it's this idea of emotional courage, the willingness to feel, and. Yeah. And I'm right in the. I'm looking at all the copy editors' uh, changes right now. I'm in the middle of it, so I'm. It's kind of on my mind. Did you love that? <laughs> I, yeah, right. And and it's I I the this the pushback is I don't know if it's that we forget like yeah the it's that it's when we talked about courage earlier is that it's hard that that even listening can be hard if I feel yeah. like I know the answer and you're telling me something I don't want to hear. It's not that I forget to listen or to ask a question or to be appreciative. It's that I'm triggered and, I, and maybe even I have the skill of passion that I'm so passionate about the project right. and, I, and I feel threatened that you're, you're going to uh, suggest something that's going to get in the way of the success and I get reactive. And I, and I think it's, I, I wonder, I wonder, I'm no, actually curious of your perspective as to whether it's deeper than just forgetting and it's more about the psychological emotional challenge of patience and and of of the the courage to feel things we don't want to feel in order to be present and take the actions that we need to take absolutely and and you know i i in in teaming i talk about you know there's part of teaming's power is that you work with conflicting points of view and you get somewhere right more, more powerful by working together and for all of the reasons you just said, that's not easy. And so, you know, there's a whole, I have a whole chapter in there like on dealing with, you know, emotionally laden conflict. So there are, you know, there's really two kinds of conflicts and, and, and I don't want to, I think it's overly simplistic to say, um, you know, relationship and task because 
if we're doing the work and we disagree and it's something that I hold dear and strongly believe is right, I'm going to get emotional and I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to suddenly not like you very much. So, so what, what I, what I, so you're absolutely right. This is hard. There's three kind of skills, I, if you will, that I think you need to practice. But the first one is by far the hardest and that's, that's emotional self regulation. And that's, you know, I'm sure your book um, will talk a lot about that, but I, it's the, it's the, um, ability to kind of stop, uh, um, you know, breathe and challenge my own thinking for just a moment. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes it's a simple, you know, my brain is saying he is such a jerk. Right. <laughs> and sometimes it's as simple as reminding myself to say, I wonder why he's such a jerk. Right. right. It's not, I haven't had to go all the way over the hill to, Oh, he's probably a wonderful guy acting, you know, acting in ways that are frustrating me. Right. Now, that's asking me to be saint-like, and I can't do that. But if I can just get myself over that little speed bump to be curious about your jerkiness, then, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm making an inroad into self-management. So it's I get to stop. I get to challenge my automatic thinking, which right. is generally incomplete, um, and ask myself like, okay, what, you know, what, what might I have to do to kind of come at this another way? And I have to recognize that my tacit model is to be selling. I know I'm right. So how do I get you to be right. recognize that I'm right and you're wrong? That's a losing battle. Right. right? So instead I've got to be like, okay, I want to advocate my point of view. And I guess I better be open to learning more about yours. Right. It, it's um, it's amazing. I mean, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking about my own career trajectory and my own growth and development over you know 30 years, and and it's amazing to me how hard those yeah. little shifts are. How how long it takes. I mean, I think I'm finally kind of, sort of, sometimes getting it. Yeah. But how hard it is to go from selling to curiosity, and how incredibly powerful curiosity is. And, and how comfortable we are knowing things and how important it is to be in that space of not knowing things if we're going to team effectively. It's so, I think that's so true and so well said. And if you think back, I, I mean, early on you said, um, you know, part of the problem we have, we, don't, we, don't, we think we might look weak if we're asking questions and, and kind of saying, oh, I need to learn and so on. And yet, if you think about your own experience, anytime you encounter a leader or a colleague who is kind of curious, you know, they've got light in their eyes, they're curious, they're, you know, you realize you find them more compelling right. than the know-it-alls. Right. right. No so question. I mean, no obvious, question. But so... So why hard. do we still do it? Why do we still, like, do the things we know are totally self-sabotaging and yet... You know, it's very, it's, it's, it, we want to be seen a certain way and we have a story that in order to be seen that way, we have to, you know, it's, I mean, it is, there's some level of insecurity and there's all these things. And maybe even the question of why isn't important. Maybe the right. question is how do we yeah. shift? Although I think it's important that, I mean, I think there's, we have a little bit of insight into the why in the sense, you know, I said before we were blind, but um, Lee Ross Stanford calls this, you know, we're naive realists, right? So mm -hmm. I literally believe I have the experience of thinking I see reality, right? And then I'm, I'm pretty sure you see it too. And but and as soon as you sort of come out with some wrong headed view, I immediately I don't do it on purpose, but I immediately go to, okay, he's self interested, or he's stubborn, or he's not smart enough, or whatever, you know, whatever my little attribution is, right. generally unflattering about you. So, so we have to understand that we do this automatically. Right. You know, it, in fact, let me back up even further and say teaming is hard because it has to overcome these natural cognitive emotional dynamics. Right. And so, you know, if I could say to people in organizations, listen, you're better off skipping teaming because it's just really hard and you probably won't do it very well. Right. I would, <laughs> but I can't. Right. right. I can't reason I can't is not because I think it's a better way to work, but because it's unnecessary. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's inevitable because right. you must collaborate with people because today's work is generally 
uh, interdependent and complex and uncertain, and it's not done by individuals working alone in a vacuum. Right. Um, I'm curious about uh, the the academic environment in which you operate. You're at Harvard, and there's and I I think it's so. Um, interesting how many people do research with each other because you see it all the time with grad yeah. students and with each other and I love that and yet the academic environment has a you know a reputation of being very individualistic and kind of tough on on and critical of 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 people and each other and I'm wondering how your research has shifted in any way if it has the way you approach teaming you know, at Harvard and, and with your colleagues and with maybe others who might not be as prone to effective teaming. Yeah. You know, it's funny because for a long time, like in the first, um, say, you know, 10 years of my career, I probably had a much higher percent of solo authored work than most people. I don't say that as a boast, but as a kind of, you know, yeah. I was very happy. I said before I was an introvert, I was very happy off it. my keyboard you know, doing my own thing, getting my data. And, um, and in fact, I really, I discovered the joys of collaboration along the way when I had that opportunity. And probably the first great collaboration opportunity I had was a, a study of surgical teams with a doctor and an economist. You know, so we have a social psychologist, a doctor, and an economist. Sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, right? <laughs> um, but it was really fun because there was this, wait a minute, you know, you see it like that. Right. Um, what a, you know, what a strange way to, uh, to see it, but it enriched me, right? right. It, made my, it made my thinking bigger. It's almost like teaming confronts all these hurdles that we've been talking about. Right. And they're worth confronting because I'm, I'm literally going to school as I do it, right? I'm getting smarter. You know, the rough edges are, are, are to, coming. To keep, with your, to keep with your theme of uh, creating verbs out of nouns, you are being schooled. Or no, right, being schooled right. would be, you're right. schooled, uh, schooling. I'm learning, I'm yeah, learning, yeah, right? right? I'm right. learning as I go, which is why teaming and learning are so right. intertwined. Right. And that's what's needed in today's, you know, complex, ambiguous, uncertain world. We all have to be teaming and learning to be effective right. all the time. And it doesn't come naturally. Therefore, it takes a lot of leadership or coaching or, you know, peer counseling or, or what have you. Amy, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I, I want to appreciate one very particular thing. I love the book. I love it's It's so Thanks. fun to talk to you. And I and I hope we get lots more opportunities to do that. I had a whole list of questions. I didn't get to any of them. Um, but I mean, I just, you know, this, yeah. the conversation just developed organically. Um, I, I want to just particularly appreciate the way you take any either or situation I give you and connect them with an and. And I think that's so realistic for life. Like it's, I think you can't say this or that. It's always some combination of them. And that's what allows us to keep our curiosity. So it's sort of an underlying methodology for encouraging curiosity is to recognize that both are true in most situations where we think we have to choose one or the other. So I really, like you've demonstrated that behavior beautifully in, in this conversation. And I so appreciate you being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much. It was a delight talking with you. I mean that so sincerely. What a treat. I feel the same way. <laughs>